News of the Times Serial Killer Saturdays Jonathan Balls Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at the extraordinary case of Jonathan Balls in 1846, one of England's worst serial killers, with an original suspected death count of nine family members, a daughter, his wife, and several grandchildren. He was, by all accounts, quite fond of his various grandchildren, with visits to the grandfather's house considered a treat for the children. As the case drew the attention of the Home Office, leading to an inquiry, more suspicious deaths unfolded, including his own parents, his father and mother, as well as a neighbour who shrewdly accused him of killing his grandchildren. As more investigations continued, the possible murder count of Balls was guessed at up to 22 people over a 20-year period. The attempted murder of a second daughter, who wished for an autopsy of her third dead child, and a servant in the household who had given in her notice to leave, were both unsuccessful. Before we continue, we humbly request that if you like the show, please do like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. We are a small, fledgling channel, hoping to expand and provide even more content. Your support would be so helpful in making this happen. Thank you. Now back to the story. We take a look at the life and crimes of Jonathan Balls in today's episode of Serial Killer Saturday. We hope you enjoy the show. About Jonathan Balls Jonathan Balls, referred to in the papers as Old Balls, was born in 1769 in the small village of Happisburg. The village of Happisburg is situated on a cliff overhanging the sea, 30 miles from Yarmouth and 15 miles south of Cromer, the population amounting in 1846 to not more than 200 or 300 persons. Balls and his wife Elizabeth had three daughters, who themselves had numerous children between them. Balls is reported to have had several run-ins with the police and was known in the neighbourhood as being, quote, a mischievous old man, end quote. He had been twice charged with arson. It was reported that he seemed to have had a good relationship with his wife, children and grandchildren. Although not described as a warm man, the family as a whole seemed close in the community with much visiting of each other. The family were poor. At the time of the investigations in 1846, Balls was 78 and his wife was 82 and bedridden. They were on parochial support. The unfortunate extended family seemed to have been almost cursed with child after child dying as well as Ball's wife. Nothing is actually done, and no suspicions are raised by the authorities until the death of Jonathan Balls himself, when the succession of previous deaths come to light. From the Morning Chronicle, the May the 20th, 1846, Poisoning and Suspected Suicide. The investigation concerning the recent wholesale murders by poisoning in Happisburg, near Norwich, which we briefly noticed in our journal on Monday last, was brought to a close this evening by Mr Pilgrim, one of the Norfolk County coroners at the Heronsburg Hill House. In the parish lived an old couple named Jonathan and Anne Elizabeth Balls, the former 77 and the latter 82. They were supported by parochial relief. The woman 
having for several years been bedridden. They had three daughters married who had a number of children, and it is the sudden and suspicious deaths of several of them that gave rise to the rumours of their being poisoned, and hence arose the coroner's inquiry. Three years ago, an infant nine weeks old named Anne Elizabeth Pestle, a grandchild of the Bulls, died and was buried within a few hours. The next was a boy, Samuel, of the same parents, whose death took place under similar circumstances in last September. Three months afterwards, two more deaths in the family occurred. Bull's wife and another of the grandchildren, Elizabeth and Pestle, who were buried on one day. Although the sudden character of the deaths excited much sensation in the parish, yet nothing of a suspicious feeling seemed to exist. The death of Bulls, however, after being attacked in a similar way as the other deceased members of the family, many rumours got afloat in the neighbourhood that his death was the result of poison. It would appear that even then there seems to have been no real investigation until the neighbours insisted. From the Morning Chronicle, May the 20th, 1846, Poisoning and Suspected Suicide. Notwithstanding which corpse was buried, but communications having been sent to the coroners, those gentlemen at length took the matter up and issued at summons as to the authorities for the disinterment of Jonathan Bowles and Anne Elizabeth Pestle, and the impanelling of a jury to inquire into the cause at their death. The inquest was adjourned on Thursday last in order to allow a post-mortem examination of the bodies being made, and on the jury reassembling, the coroner informed them that they should again adjourn the inquiry until Monday the 18th, with a view of having the three other bodies lying in the churchyard exhumed and examined. From this first initial inquest, which was later criticised by government authorities for its limited scope, the bodies of Anne Elizabeth Pestle, granddaughter, aged two years, Samuel Pestle, grandson, aged three years, and Elizabeth Anne Balls, Balls' wife, aged 82, are all confirmed. Testimony is given that Balls was seen placing white powder in his wife's teapot. She died three days later. From the Morning Chronicle, May the 20th, 1846, Poisoning and Suspected Suicide. Sarah Kerrison, a young girl living as a servant at Great Yarmouth, was next called. I am a native of Haysborough and lived with Mrs. Ball for nearly five years. On the Friday previous to her death, she was taken very sick. I have seen her husband give her some drink, generally cold water or cold tea. He always mixed the tea for her. He generally made it in the teapot and poured it into another one that was only used by her. One day, after she was taken ill, I saw her husband put some water into the teapot and then dropped two or three pinches of a powder into it. It was white and seemed to me to be flour. As far as I can recollect, that took place on the Saturday as she died on the Tuesday. She was very sick afterwards. When I saw the white powder put into the teapot, there was no one present but Balls. The old man in my presence seemed very kind to her. More testimony is given that Balls had ensured that the grandchildren staying at his house at the time had had a hearty meal before their death. It was also established 
that Balls had purchased large amounts of arsenic over the years, purportedly because of his rats in the house, although no one could attest to having seen his house have any rats. From the Morning Chronicle, May the 20th, 1846, Poisoning and Suspected Suicide. Phoebe Ann Reed, a single woman, said she knew Bulls some years. About two years ago, he asked her to write a letter to Mr. Sadler of North Walsham, druggist, to get some arsenic as he wanted to destroy rats. I refused several times, and he said, You need not be afraid. I'm not going to use it for any bad purpose. Lastly, the post-mortem examination confirms large doses of arsenic in all the bodies, including in Jonathan Ball's body as well. From the Morning Chronicle, May the 20th, 1846, Poisoning and Suspected Suicide, the coroner proceeded to sum up the evidence. He thought the facts did not fix upon any party so as to warrant them in sending the case to another tribunal if any one was inculculated. The finger of suspicion most certainly pointed to the deceased, Jonathan Balls, and he was now beyond the reach of the law. He recommended them to return such a verdict as would enable the officer to have the matter further inquired into, should such circumstances arise as required it. It was a case of great suspicion. The story becomes national headlines quickly, as it now would seem that the small country out-of-the-way village has been harbouring a grandfather serial killer. From the whole packet, May 22nd, 1846, suspected murder of six persons by poison. North Walsham, Friday night. Nothing can exceed the sensation that prevails in this portion of the county of Norfolk, consequent on the recent discovery of a system of wholesale poisoning by which six persons are already known to have perished, and the bodies of others are now being exhumed for the purpose of examination. Mr. John Ball, a respected man living in the village of Happisburg, a few miles distant, his wife and four children, having died within a very short period and in a very sudden manner, suspicions were naturally excited. A communication was forwarded to Mr. Pringle, one of the coroners for the county, who issued his warrant for holding an inquest and directed that two of the bodies should be exhumed. This was done, and on their being subjected to a post-mortem examination by three experienced medical gentlemen of the neighbourhood, they declared that each body contained as much arsenic as would poison the inhabitants of the whole parish. The coroner, on learning the results of the medical gentleman's operations, issued instructions to the parochial officers for the disinterment of other bodies of Mr. Ball's family. This has been carried into effect, a tent being erected in the parish churchyard to cover the bodies. These are understood to have been examined by the surgeons and the cause of death ascertained to have been by arsenic. Several witnesses have been examined by the coroner. The parties suspected are known to have purchased arsenic at different places about the time of the deaths of the deceased. During the last twelve weeks, several relatives of Ball have died in a mysterious manner, and the exhumation of their bodies is determined upon, and the inquest is adjourned in order to give the medical gentleman time to examine them. Further particulars. The investigations was brought to a close on Monday evening by Mr Pilgrim, one of the Norfolk County coroners, at the Happersborough Hill House, and the disclosures which were made during the inquiry leave very little doubt 
that the appalling acts of poison have been going on for years, and it is impossible to conjecture how many unfortunate persons have fallen as sacrifice. The bodies are exhumed and an inquest jury empanelled. This required the jury to view the exhumed corpses in the coffins. The jury were surprised to find Jonathan Balls in his coffin with two walking sticks, one on each side of his body, an iron poker, several pocket handkerchiefs, and a piece of plum cake in each hand. As the investigation begins to gain momentum, a rash of suspicious deaths is also discovered in the neighbouring village of East Rushton. Workmen, Ball's mother and father, and even more grandchildren are now suspected with bodies being exhumed and examined in bulk. Such is the notoriety of the case, it is brought up in the House of Commons and pointed to the office of the Home Secretary to review. From the Morning Chronicle, May the 26th, 1846, the wholesale murders by poisoning in Norfolk. Great is the excitement throughout this part of the county on the discovery of recent horrible cases of poisoning. It has been renewed and increased considerably by the circumstance of the Secretary of State, Sir James Graham, having expressed his intention to reinvestigate the circumstance attending this mysterious affair. A government officer has already arrived and assisted by Mr. Superintendent Smith of the Ludlam Division of the Norfolk Police Force and Colonel Oakes, the Chief Constable of the county, having been making private inquiries, the result of which not only confirms what was stated at the coroner's investigation, but goes far to clear up the matter and point out the perpetrator of the diabolical crime. It seems that the cases of poisoning which have occurred in this neighbourhood are more numerous and appalling than was at first imagined, and that the report of the inquests before the county coroner will give but a poor idea of what has been done in this dreadful system. Suspicion not stronger than that which now exists, with reference to the cause of death of many others, lead to the examination of the bodies of four persons and that of old balls. The evidence at the inquest proved that four out of the five had been poisoned, and the probability of balls intentionally administering it. In addition to these details, there were several other grandchildren of balls whose deaths were as sudden and as suspicious, and hence arise the supposition that if a strict inquiry were made respecting their fate, they would be found to have perished by similar means. Within ten years, no fewer than twelve grandchildren of the deceased, Jonathan Balls, eight belonging to his daughter, Mrs. Green, and four to the other daughter, Mrs. Pestle, the subject of the recent proceedings before the coroner, who died after being attacked all alike. To this list may be added Balls and his wife, both clearly ascertained to have perished from arsenic, and yet in all these very suspicious deaths only one inquest was held until the inquiry consequent on the shocking discovery. All the children were in the habit of visiting their grandfather's house. By several parties it has been proved that old Balls was in the habit of buying arsenic for years past, for what purpose was not learned. There are a few residing in the vicinity who remember Balls' father and mother dying suddenly, and in a very suspicious way, similar to the other deaths twenty-two years ago. 
they came to live with him and shortly afterwards perished. It is also ought to be stated that during the last few years, many labouring men who were in the habit of mixing greatly in Ball's society and visiting him at his house have died after two or three days' illness, and from a cause far from being satisfactorily explained. These numerous deaths, all of a similar character, coupled with the circumstance of old bulls being known to have been guilty of several wicked acts, has naturally given rise to a general opinion throughout the district that these persons have been poisoned in the same way. As has been mentioned, Bulls was in the habit of perpetrating several disgusting transactions and according to a statement made by us by one of the heads of the police, has been twice charged with a serious offence of arson, and was generally termed in the village as a mischievous old man. One fact shows very clearly that Balls was alone in the stressful affair, which unfortunately was lost sight of by the coroner and the jury. When the last child of his daughter, Mrs. Pestle, died, the mother became alarmed and said she would preserve the piece of membrane which the child threw up and give it to the surgeon, Mr. Hewitt, to be examined. This circumstance was stated at the coroner's inquiry, but it did not come out in the medical testimony. Through the piece of membrane, indigestion had been examined. Mrs. Pestle Stating her determination, the old man replied, Oh, don't do that, but in her still declaring her intention to do so, he must have taken the poison immediately afterwards, for he was a corpse in a few hours. It is deemed remarkable that these repeated deaths did not excite the suspicion of the vicar of the parish, the registrar, the surgeon, or the rural police. It is stated that, that there has been a feeling amongst the magistrates of this county that the expenses of coroner's inquests should be reduced, that inquest should not be held so frequently, and even that a circular has been sent to the officers of this very parish, impressing upon them the necessity of carrying out their suggestion. It is anticipated that the preliminary inquiry will terminate about tomorrow night, and a report of the result will probably be forwarded to the Home Office on Tuesday. Whether any more bodies will be exhumed and examined will no doubt depend upon the official inquiries. With the Secretary of State now personally involved, resources are poured into the village and many of the neighbouring villages to try to ascertain just how many deaths Jonathan Balls was responsible for. From the Northern Star, June 6, 1846 The Murders by Poisoning in Norfolk The investigation instituted by the Secretary of State concerning the late murders by poisoning in this village progresses. The horrors seems to thicken. To what extent deaths have been occasioned by poison, it is impossible to say. It is, however, determined upon to exhume seven other bodies, and coroner's inquests are to be held upon them. They will undergo a strict examination by a most experienced chemist, and a rigid and searching inquiry will take place into all the circumstances connected with these extraordinary and suspicious deaths. The seven bodies are not as yet exhumed. Consequently, the coroner has been unable to fix the day for the inquest. Among the bodies to be exhumed is that of a man named Nurse, who was a neighbour of the deceased Balls, and with reference to this man, the girl Sarah Kerrison of Yarmouth, 
who it will be remembered lived with old Balls as a servant and gave very important testimony at the recent coroner's inquest, says that a short time before she left Balls' house, she heard Balls and Nurse have a quarrel about the death of Balls' grandchildren, in which quarrel Nurse accused Balls of being the cause of their deaths. After a time, this quarrel subsided and the parties agreed to make it up by going to a neighbouring public house and having some beer. They accordingly went and had something to drink and in three hours afterwards, Nurse was a corpse. Yet there was no suspicion. The body was interred and the occurrence forgotten. From that moment, however, the girl suspected some foul play and determined on leaving the house which she did shortly afterwards and obtained a situation at Yarmouth. As it was, she nearly fell a victim to the murderous traffic. A few days prior to the death of Ball's wife, while partaking of breakfast with old Balls and one of his daughters, Mrs. Green, she was suddenly seized with a violent sickness. Mrs. Green was attacked in a similar way, almost immediately afterwards, no doubt the effect of some poisonous drug, but, happily, they had not taken sufficient to act fatally. Ball's parents, who were poor people living at Berminstead, an adjacent village, appear to have died in a sudden and mysterious way, and their bodies, we understand, are amongst those to be taken up. The remainder are the grandchildren of Ball's, who perished very young. As witnesses are brought forward and bodies are exhumed, what comes across is an obvious pattern. But, with Balls acting so kindly to his grandchildren, no suspicion whatsoever was entertained by his children, the parents of the dead children. As one of his daughters, Mary Green, described in court, her father, Balls, was in the habit of bringing cake to the child. He brought some on the morning of its death. The cakes were homemade, but she cannot say who made them. Martha died about the same time. Before she died, she was not in good health, and was scarcely ever well. She was thirteen months old. Witness heard that her father gave the child bread and butter and other things. She had been ill about three weeks when she died. Her father used to come and see her on a Sunday morning and would say, Poor little thing, how bad it is. Mary Green goes on to describe how she has kept some of the emissions from her last child's death and intends it analysed. Her father, Jonathan, discourages her and then invites her to have breakfast at his house with his servant, who has given in her notice. She was up in the morning with the young girl, Sarah Kerrison, and her father wished her to have some breakfast. Kerrison made the tea, and her father asked her to have a herring, saying, There are two for you and Kerrison. They were cooked, and they had one each, but neither her father nor her mother partook of any. Before she had finished her breakfast, she was seized with sickness, threw up her meal, and in half an hour, went home. She continued sick till ten or eleven o'clock at night, and was ill for two or three days, but not knowing whether she would live or not, she told her father and mother how ill she had been. Her father said nothing, but her mother seemed moved. Kerrison was also very ill, throwing up for two days in a similar manner. As Mary Green is describing the attempts on her life from her father in the court, she breaks down into hysterics and has to be physically removed from the room. The witness was here seized with strong hysterics and was carried out of the inquest room and she shortly recovered but seemed in a dreadfully dejected state. From the now spreading area of investigations, more 
and more bodies are found to have been poisoned by arsenic. From the Northern Star, June the 6th, 1846, the murders by poisoning in Norfolk. By the list that had been handed to the coroner by the officers of the victims, we find, in addition to the bodies of Jonathan Balls, the supposed murderer, his wife, Elizabeth Samuel, Anne Elizabeth, and Elizabeth Anne Pestle, his grandchildren, whose deaths were inquired into at the former inquest. That of Anne Peggs, a grandchild, who died on the 7th of June 1839 in her eighth year and was buried at Itham Chapel. The next on the list is Maria Green, daughter of Mrs Green, another daughter of Jonathan Balls. This victim was 15 months old and died on the 25th of December 1836 and was buried at East Rushton. The infant had been to the grandfather's house and while there was attacked with illness and shortly after expired, no surgeon being called to it. Next, the body of William Green, also a grandchild, aged two years, died on the 31st of October 1851 and interred at East Rushton. He had also been to his grandfather's and was seized with illness on his return home. And lastly, Martha Green of the same family. She died when 15 months old after visiting Old Ball's house and was buried with the others in the same churchyard. One of the daughters of Jonathan Balls, Mrs Green, and mother of the three children, the subject of inquiry this day, is in the greatest distress of mind, and having taken a portion of the poison given to her by her father, she is still suffering for, from its pernicious effects. The more they went into the inquiry, the worse it became. The jury now adjourned for half an hour and on reassembling it was announced that the surgeons had only examined the body of Maria Green, the child that had been buried ten years and they had discovered the presence of poison. Under the guidance of the Home Secretary suspicions arose that Ball had killed up to twenty-two people, such as neighbours, those he had had arguments with, his daughter, Maria Lacey, with whom it was said he was fond. But no real proof could be made within the tenuous relationships of Ball's and those outside of his family, and the investigations were quietly dropped once the body count had been established within his own family, where the corpses were not too decomposed to allow for testing. Jonathan Balls of 1846 certainly remains one of the most prolific serial killers in England, with an expected duration of some 20 years across several villages and an estimated kill count of 22 murders of family, friends, and anyone unfortunate enough to cross his path. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. Jonathan Balls, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century 
to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.